Hi, um, I'm Jen Groska, and it is my honor to introduce this year's presidential address. Typically, uh, the person who does the introduction is the PhD advisor for the president, but Vicki Weiss wasn't available. I'm sure she would have told many inspirational stories of Eve as a mentee, so I will try to live up to that. Um, Eve and I started graduate school at the same time at the University of Nebraska. We had our first day of law school orientation 22 years ago. Um, and that was our first first. And then we had our first poster presentations at APLS two years later together. And then I was the first person that got to hold her baby after Mabry was born. I knew I wasn't gonna get through that one. <laughs> <laughs> Followed by many other firsts, um, like our first half marathon we ran together, first tattoos. You can check Eve's out on her ankle right above her, I kid you not, blue suede shoes. <laughs> That's right. Um, and many other very important firsts, like the first time she took me to Krispy Kreme and um, Crystal Burger and our, watching the first season of Survivor together. And now I get to introduce her for the first time she gets to address you all as president. So who is Eve Brank? Well, Eve grew up in Ohio, or was born in Ohio, like me, Buckeyes, and then moved to Florida. She went to college at Jacksonville University. Anyone want to guess what she majored in? Oh my god, psychology. How'd you, how'd you know? <laughs> I should throw candy out. Um, but also, sociology. She was a double major and a history minor. And what you may not know about Eve is that she's actually a first-generation college graduate and she put herself through school on a full scholarship, right? And not only a double major and a minor, but a first-gen student. And that's your sort of first taste of the tenacity of Eve Brink, right? The first of many. Um, so in college, she became inspired to enter the field of psychology and law in part through an experience she had uh, working at a juvenile detention facility. So then she decided to go to grad school and went to the University of Nebraska for a JD and PhD, and that's where I met her. And <laughs> then four years of graduate school shenanigans ensued <laughs> until Eve had a baby right after we graduated from law school. And that was when her husband found out he got into med school at University of Florida. And so instead of having two plus, I don't know, to 50 years to finish her PhD, um, <laughs> Eve had to finish it in one year. With an infant, studying for the bar exam, moving to Florida, <laughs> and she still did it, right? More tenacity. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then she moves to Florida and she has to find a job, right? Limited setting to support her family. So she starts working in the statistics department as an adjunct instructor until she got a tenure track position in the criminology, law, and society department, where she worked for five years before returning home to the University of Nebraska, where she's been for many years now, mentoring and teaching students in our program. But wait, wait, there's more. <laughs> Not only does she do that, but she's also now the director for the Nebraska Center on Children, Families, and the Law. It's just a huge position to undertake. All of those accomplishments were enough, though. During that time, she was tenaciously serving our organization in many roles, including chairing the dissertation award committee, co-chairing the annual conference in her alma mater city of Jacksonville, uh, secretary, treasurer, the list goes on and on. And she also was a member of the APA Committee on Legal Issues, a member of the Leadership Institute for Women Psychologists, and has been a member of the LHB Editorial Board for many years. All of that is to say that Eve is possibly the hardest working person that I know. It's embarrassing, honestly. It's kind of shameful, you know, when we get together, how much more she can accomplish in one day than I can. Right? <laughs> um, this tenacity with which she has approached her life means that she gets it done. And she gets it done for APLS. She gets it done for us. And you would think that someone who's so accomplished in their professional life could be a total jerk to deal with in person, right? Just insufferable. But anyone that knows Eve knows that she is one of the kindest, most generous people that you will ever meet. And oh, that laugh. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> I hope she laughs during her talk. Because <laughs> now she's not going to do it. <laughs> She will open her office, her home, her lab, and her heart to you. Do you know what she did on her 40th birthday? Yes, yes, I know. So her lab is not up here because they had to do it. OK, so many of you may know that Eve runs a lot. She runs a lot of marathons. How many marathons do you think Eve's run? Too many? <laughs> 23 in 21 different states. She's trying to get to all 50, right? <laughs> if she hadn't already done one in Nashville, she'd probably run a marathon right now, right? You would. Yeah. You totally would. <laughs> <laughs> so on her 40th birthday, what did she do? What does people do on their day? Go to a bar? Go to a party? Run 40 miles. You run 40 miles! And you make your friends do it with you, because why not? And not only that, you turn it into a fundraiser to raise money for a close family member who was seriously injured in a car accident. Because why do something just for yourself on such a milestone birthday when you can do something great for other people? And that is Eve, in a nutshell. Anyone who's been the beneficiary of her friendship knows that this exceptional level of generosity is not unusual. So today's International Women's Day, right, in case you haven't been on the Facebooks <laughs> all day yet. <laughs> so we're supposed to think of women who inspire us. Well, today, I don't have to look far, because Eve is an inspiration to me, as I am sure she is to many of you as well. And it is my pleasure to introduce her as the president of APLS. Thank you, Jen, very much. Um, and I asked Jen to do my introduction because I really cannot imagine a better person um, to do it because she is um, really the reason I am who I am as a scholar and most definitely my leadership in this organization. Uh, for your viewing pleasure, um, this is a photo of Jen and me <laughs> at her second and my first APLS. This was exactly 20 years ago yesterday. That conference was in Redondo Beach, California. When this picture was taken at the Nebraska party, we had no idea that we would soon be stranded in Denver with only our Redondo Beach clothing. <laughs> I've always admired Jen for many, many wonderful attributes and definitely her guidance in this organization. Um, my first leadership position, she mentioned, was the Dissertation Awards Committee Chair. That was 13 years ago, and I followed directly after Jen in that position. Um, she was also the conference co-chair for APLS, the conference right before I co-chaired. And I am certain I would not have volunteered for either of those positions or be standing here today if I hadn't watched Jen excel at them. She made them look far easier than I found them to be. Over the years, we've had our share of fun at conferences, uh, and I apologize if you were ever roomed next to us and you heard that laugh that she mentioned. Um, our program of research on the Fourth Amendment was even hatched at an APLS conference, possibly over a bottle of wine. Um, so thank you, Jen. Uh, for too many conferences to count, that very overly generous introduction. I look forward to many years to come of our continued involvement in APLS together, our research collaborations, and most importantly, our friendship. Many recent APLS presidents, as Jen mentioned, have their dissertation mentors do their introduction. Uh, and fortunately, my advisor, Dr. Victoria Wise, is not at APLS this year, but I would be remiss not to spend a few minutes talking about her. Uh, this is us at my PhD graduation. Uh, and at one of my many meetings, my last year of my PhD program, and yes, that is my baby on my lap. Um, and I had my daughter, as Jen mentioned, the summer before my last year of graduate school. And I always say that Vicki was uh, as excited, if not more excited, than my own mother was when I told her I was pregnant. Um, I am certain there is no way I would have finished that dissertation as, I, uh, as quickly as I did without Vicki as my advisor. She graciously accommodated that new mother schedule in a way that I hope I, I'm able to do for my students. I think she definitely enjoyed our meetings much more when they looked like this. And this is actually a rarity that my daughter was on my lap and not hers. Um, and uh, Vicki and her husband, Alan Tompkins, 
both remain caring um, and valuable mentors to me, and I'm extremely grateful to both of them. So I want to start off by telling you a story about the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Of course, as an alum and current faculty of UNL, most of you know I never pass up the opportunity to put in a plug for Nebraska. In this instance, the story is about our new chancellor. Dr. Ronnie Green is a man I respect both professionally and personally, and I was delighted to be able to attend his installation ceremonies last year. Um, it not only provided me an opportunity to get to wear my academic regalia, which I just really love to do, um, but it also gave me an opportunity to hear his vision for our university and to learn about his own personal outlook on life. And the one point that stuck out the most to me was that he said his family uh, lived by the mantra that to whom much is given, much is due. I was so struck by this because that is what I believe. Um, and I also believe that was the motto my husband and I were teaching our daughter. I sat there in the auditorium with my academic tam proudly perched on my head and sat up a little bit straighter thinking um, that this is my daughter and husband and I and how grateful we are for what we have been given. How we know that gratefulness should be poured back into others. My husband was raised primarily by a single mom and had numerous other challenges placed before him on his way to becoming a successful and sought after physician in our community. I am, as Jen said, very proudly a first generation college graduate. And even though I did not have parents who knew from their own experiences how to navigate higher education, they were and continue to be thankfully my biggest fans and cheerleaders. My parents embody and taught me the importance of faith in God, gratefulness, and giving of oneself. So I excitedly came home from that chancellor's installation to tell my husband and daughter that the new UNL chancellor had the same family motto that we did. In exchange for my excitement, I got blank stares and then some smirks. Um, there was some uncomfortable silence. And it was clear that they did not agree that the thread binding our little three-person family together uh, was the same as our chancellor's. My then 16-year-old daughter thought for a few moments and said, Mom, our family motto is suck it up. <laughs> <sighs> to my horror, my husband quickly agreed. And then they both relayed stories of how we say this to each other quite regularly, especially me to them. <laughs> and apparently one of my daughter's most distinct memories was running a 5K, which is a little over three miles if you haven't done the APLS fun run before, uh, and me telling her to suck it up when she started to complain about being tired. And here's the important and embarrassing part of that story. She was four years old. <laughs> She is now a successful high school senior and says that this is her own personal mantra that has fueled her success academically and personally. And she actually still does run and she's training for her second full marathon right now. I would also guess that my graduate students know this as our unofficial lab motto. My past and present graduate students serve as a great source of personal motivation and pride for me. Um, nonetheless, I bet if I haven't said this to them outright, my facial expressions on a regular basis have certainly told them to suck it up when it comes to research, coursework, and general life. So interestingly, at least to me, there is no clear universally agreed upon origin for the expression suck it up. The most common cited reference I could find comes from uh, World War II pilots. So if a pilot happened to throw up in their oxygen mask. I'm going to keep going. They, <laughs> they had to suck it up. Otherwise, they would breathe the acidic fumes into their lungs and die. I really, I have no idea if that makes any kind of medical any sense at all, but that's what I found on the internet. Um, also, according to Urban Dictionary, which is also another great professional resource, um, <laughs> It is a drinking game that combines rock, paper, scissors, and shots of alcohol, preferably Goldschlager, apparently. Um, also just sounds awful and probably has the same outcome as that vomit oxygen mask thing. Um, okay, so anyway, the, 
the drinking game and swallowing vomit aside, uh, for me, it is the, the phrase is all about efficiency. I know I have told myself personally to suck it up many times over the past 13 years that I served on the APLS executive board. When we are in the thick of discussions and in the weeds, it can feel like we are moving at a glacial speed, um, both in this organization and in society in general. As the phrase goes, it's like we're herding cats. Yes, those are my two cats in their Halloween costumes. <laughs> Those of you who have served on APLSEC, I know it can seem like we are repeating the same issues and discussions. I know I get cynical in these situations. Just as I felt when my daughter was complaining during that race, I yearned for action rather than discussions and thinking. I didn't want to hear how bad it hurt. I just wanted to see her finish that race. Therefore, when I was given this great honor of being the APLS president, I definitely didn't just want to discuss and think. I wanted action. But what does that actually mean? Because here's the problem. I have run into many a burning issue without thought and discussion, and the kerfuffle that almost always ensues is not pretty for me or anyone else. So when I found out I was going to be the APLS president, I decided to take a different uh, view. I stepped back and tried to take a whole new approach. I read leadership books, I did research about organizational health, and I considered what I remembered from those past five presidential addresses. I even cheated, and I watched those recordings to refresh my memories of what our past presidents have discussed and where they wanted to see us go. I'm sure all of you prepared for this conference in the same way, right? <laughs> well, if you didn't, let me remind you. Bill Foote, in 2013, spoke about his translational work on a case involving sexual abuse. He called for more cross-cultural and translational work in our, in our field. Jennifer Scheme, in 2014, spoke about innovating and broadening the law psychology field. She highlighted the narrowness of our conference presentations and our published work. Patty Zaff, in 2015, talked about how we communicate our science to others and how we can take our life, work, and passion and turn it into something that we can provide to others who can use it. Jennifer Woolard, in 2016, asked us how we should be focusing on social justice and using our knowledge to affect good change. And finally, last year, David DiMatteo warned us of the challenges we face in science generally and law psychology specifically. In particular, he focused on increasing legal scholars' participation in our organization. And I agree with all my predecessors' assessment. They're clearly gifted individuals, uh, and I have much more respect for them than I even had before after serving in this role for the past seven months. I know we have work to do. I know there are many ways we should improve as an organization. But as I was re-watching those presidential addresses and preparing for this talk, I found that we actually have made a lot more progress than I realized. In fact, if I take those cynical suck it up glasses off for just a few minutes, I can see our status quite differently than I first thought. I see that APLS has been, and I believe there is evidence that it will continue to be an organization of thoughtful action and not just discussion. So I don't want to focus too much today on what's broken uh, and how we can do more. Instead, in light of everything that's been going on in our society, um, I feel like what we all need, or at least what I need, uh, is some time to focus on what is working well and what we can be proud of with APLS. I have two presidential initiatives, one focused internally and one externally. I'm going to use both of those as scaffolding to highlight some aspects of APLS that I hope we will that will make you proud uh, to be part of this organization. And maybe it will also make you want to do more uh, and take on some of those challenges my predecessors have noted. First, internally, I worked with the task force that included uh, Jennifer Groskup, Brian Cutler, Laura Levitt, Twyla Wingrove, and Kento Yasuhara. We hired an outside consultant who specializes in the functioning of organizations. The consultant talked with the task force, me, our administrative assistant, and surveyed the executive committee and committee members. And I'm gonna start with just a very small anecdote. Uh, I sent out the consultant's link to complete the executive committee member surveys one morning in January. Um, within an hour, eight people had responded to let us know that there was a problem with the survey. So the bad news was, there was a problem with the survey. Um, the consultant had made a program error, so a few of the questions weren't getting recorded appropriately. 
But the good news was that there were that many people up and so clearly invested in this organization um, that they were, wanted to give feedback about their experiences and they wanted to make sure that we knew there was something wrong. Um, the consultant noted how impressed and unusual that was for an organization like ours. Aside from that small anecdote, and on a much deeper level, the consultant is working with us to determine what we can do better as an organization to work more effectively and efficiently. In addition to her survey, she has done a full document review. Based on that review, she gave us a number of considerations, such as uh, committee structure, reorganization, governing documents, strategic planning, institutional knowledge issues, and the onboarding of our leaders. The process with the consultant is relatively new and in, in its early stages, and not really at the point where it makes sense to talk about specific plans with you today. Um, so stay tuned for those. Um, but instead, I thought it would be fun and helpful to look back a few years to see where we were and then compare it to where we are today. By its nature, this is going to be anecdotal, but I hope it will serve as encouragement to you the way it did for me. And because I'm the one speaking, I decided to go back to 1996, the year I started law school at the University of Nebraska. It also happens, just so happens, to be the latest newsletter, the earliest newsletter I could get my hands on. Um, and here it is. I, uh, Randy Otto was our newsletter editor in 1996. And he noted this new feature that had, had added a three-hole punch format um, that, uh, would, <laughs> that would allow <laughs> that would allow libraries and readers to store the newsletters in binders. <laughs> this past year, we moved to a monthly newsletter. Uh, one of our members at large, Tess Neal, piloted this, and we moved to a fully uh, monthly e-newsletter with Mark Patry and Leah Georges as the editor and associate editor, respectively. These e-newsletters arrive in your email inbox on the first of every month. They have the same information and columns as before, but divided into more frequent issues. This allows, among other benefits, for APLS to be in communication with our members on a much more regular basis. And also, we are equipped now to respond to issues in a much more timely manner. Back in 1996, the Winter Newsletter devoted a few pages that doubled as the APLS conference program. Uh, some of us remember that warning that programs would not be distributed at the conference, uh, that, that program also did not include abstracts or detailed information about presentations. Uh, this says, note, please bring this agenda to the conference. Programs will not be distributed. Uh, so rather, it was just a listing of the titles of papers and posters. Today, we have these professionally produced programs that not only serve as information while we are on site at the conference, but also provide us with details about each paper uh, being presented. And we can then reference that information once we get home. And of course, we've also embraced technology in giving us an app for the conference program. The program also is posted online before and after the conference, which further enables us to keep track of the science being reported at our conference. I do want to take a, a minute, though, to note um, here that I looked at the EC minutes from 1998, and they indicate that um, Steve Penrod suggested that the newsletter should be moved online to the new APLS website in 98. At the following EC meeting, he inquired about the possibility of putting the abstracts from the conference on the website, but found that it consisted of 3,500 hard copies, and scanning capabilities were just really not available. Steve, this says, uh, we should put the APLS newsletter and our conference programs online. Steve Penrod, 1998. Steve was definitely a man before his time because the newsletter continued to be printed and mailed until 2005. I'll also note here that around the same time Steve was suggesting our newsletter go online, he was my master's thesis advisor and the director of the law psychology program uh, at Nebraska. If you know Steve, this story is not going to surprise you at all. Uh, I was in the, the law psych suite at Nebraska and working in my office computer that Steve had assembled with scrap metal and duct tape and an old computer cord. Um, and he came into my office to tell me to check out this new search engine he had found. It was called Google. He said he thought it might be a good resource at some point. <laughs> so Steve will always be the person who introduced me to Google. And as usual, he was right. It is pretty useful. <laughs> Steve also taught me some valuable lessons in taking care of graduate students. 
He gave us free companion airline tickets so we could get to conferences uh, cheaper, let us borrow his travel printer so we could print our overheads at the conference hotels, and he really did rebuild his daughter's hand-me-down computer for our use at school. So um, I'm sorry it took us so long to implement his idea, and I think we've probably only just now truly gotten the newsletter online the way he vi envisioned in 1998. But I think importantly, to be positive, we have, we have gotten there. Okay, so back to 1996, Jim Ogloff, who is our current Distinguished Contribution Award winner, was the treasurer of APLS. He reported that in 1996, Hilton Head Conference had close to 400 people attend. That's less than half of what we have here this week. The conference also raked in a profit of $86. <laughs> in addition, Jim and Rich Weiner, who was the secretary of APLS at the time, distributed surveys to those present at a conference luncheon. APLS president Kirk Halbrin noted that APLS has never before been able to get opinions from our membership in quite so comprehensive way. Thankfully, surveying our membership has continued and certainly improved from that luncheon convenience sample. A few years ago, Laura Levitt, as chair of the membership committee, conducted a survey that resulted in responses from 329 uh, people within APLS, almost that same number of all the attendees back in the conference 20 years ago. Laura asked a number of questions about what people thought about their APLS membership. Across several questions, people strongly agreed that they valued their APLS membership, it was a good value to them, it was beneficial to them, and they planned to renew. I believe this value of our members' experience is being turned back into the organization. The 1996 EC meeting minutes suggested there were about eight committees, but several were not active. Today we have over 20 committees, all actively involved in pursuing our mission as an organization. The committees are providing grants, awards, education, resources, and so much more to our membership. It is also worth noting that we have increased our gender diversity in the past two decades. We have more than doubled the number of women on the EC. But some things seem not to change. <laughs> Tom Grisso was our elected council representative in 1996, and he is, again, not still, um, our <laughs> representing us. So despite Tom serving the organization again the same way he was 20 years ago, we clearly have seen a great deal of progress. And some of that certainly could be chalked up to technology and just general development of our society. Um, we would not, but we would not have to embrace that technology and development. I can assure you that there are divisions of APA and organizations like ours that have not, um, and they remain stagnant and are not in the enviable position, enviable position that APLS is in. All of these and all the other organizational advancements I haven't highlighted would not have happened without the nurture and care that our previous leaders have given to this organization. I am certain there were many early weekend hours and late, late nights spent by our committee members, committee chairs, and our officers. They answer APLS emails, review dissertation award nominations, prepare budgets, work on scientific review papers, compile our newsletters, uh, and many other tasks that are done on top of each of these leaders' day jobs. I am certain they did that work when undoubtedly it would have been easier to complain and not act. If you would humor me just for a minute, uh, uh, if you have ever served on an APLS committee or as a member of the executive committee, a student or otherwise, would you please stand? Thank you. That's, um, I certainly personally do not take that gift of your time lightly. For those of you who have not had the opportunity to, yet uh, to volunteer as a leader in this organization, uh, come to the business meeting next where we will highlight some upcoming volunteer opportunities. And I look forward to where you will take us in the next 20 years or even 50. In fact, as many of you know, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary throughout this year and next.
Some of you in this room will likely be here for the 75th anniversary and even possibly the 100th. Uh, probably most of us, and especially the non-student members, won't be. Uh, and there will actually be a whole new era of APLS. This led me to reflect on what kind of legacy uh, this next generation would leave, would, and who that next generation will be. Both issues relate to my second presidential initiative, that of looking externally and doing outreach in the communities where we meet for our conferences. For this initiative, I had an ama another amazing task force, Melinda will, 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 uh, well, Bransky, sorry, Matt Zajcik, April Alexander, Kathleen Kemp, Kelsey Henderson, Tom Ferrant, and Sarah Miller. We decided we would focus on three outreach efforts. The first involved APLS members going into local high schools to talk generally about the field of law psychology and specifically about their own research and practice. The second involved members of APLS Corrections Committee providing a free training for staff at a local jail. And the third was a plan to team up with the local bar association to provide free continuing legal education on civil commitment issues. And I felt like we were forging a completely new path doing this, um, something that had never been done before. But I actually discovered in my little trip down APLS newsletter memory lane um, that in 96, the late Saul Falero, pictured with me and some other students in Dublin in 99, was the chair of what was called the Educational Outreach Committee. Um, we don't have this committee anymore, uh, but in 96, Saul reported they were working with the local bar associations to provide presentations of law psychology research. I'm uncertain when those uh, bar association outreach ended, but if any of you were involved in them, I would love to hear how it worked and, and whether we can think about reinvigorating that. It, my, my daughter and my students said this picture looks like some sort of a 90s sitcom ad. So. <laughs> which it kind of was. So um, for the purposes of this address, I want to focus on the outreach into the high schools because I think that is actually something truly new. I don't think that's been done before. And additionally, it holds a special meaning for me. Uh, my story with psych and law starts quite a few years before that Redondo Beach conference. In fact, I point to a cross-country trip the summer vacation when I was 14 years old right before I started high school. Um, let me paint this picture for you, right? It's 1988, my bangs were high, and my eyeshadow was dark. <laughs> I was consumed with only one thing, being a fashion designer. <laughs> I was certain that's what I would be doing, despite this outfit I have on in this picture. <laughs> My parents and I embarked on a trip from where we lived in northeastern Florida to my aunt's house in San Diego. My dad had fixed up an old motor home and we rumbled across the country seeing pretty much all of the southern states. I had failed to go to the library before we left on this trip and this was long before you could just download a bunch of books or movies on Netflix on your phone. So I went book shopping in my family's bookcase. I don't remember how many books I took with me, but I know I took The Scarlet Letter and this book by Chuck Colson. And if you don't know who Colson is, he was part of the Richard Nixon group that pled guilty for Watergate. Um, and he started a Christian prison ministry called Prison Fellowship once he was released from prison. And I really can't tell you what it was about that combination of those two books, <laughs> riding through the southern half of the country, stopping at lots and lots of shopping malls. Um, and listening to my cassette tape of Millie Vanilli over and over again. For, by that po from that point on, I was hooked on learning more about the criminal justice system. Being hooked, of course, does not mean I knew about this particular field, right? I had a wonderful high school psychology teacher, Ms. Humphrey, but like many of us, it wasn't until college before I learned about law psychology. In fact, I was in college when I attended a GRE forum, uh, and someone was talking about these JD PhD programs. And I had to ask what a JD was, because growing up, I'd never really met an attorney. For that reason, the high school outreach we're doing at this conference hits very close to home for me, because I think about that high school student who I was 30 years ago, who had no idea about this field or really much about college or graduate school. It is also important in this city this year 
You've already heard this is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. that occurred not far from this hotel. We're clearly still struggling with civil rights issues, and we're certainly struggling with what role young people should have in our society and in the role of societal change. Impressively, many of you responded positively to the opportunity to do this new outreach effort into the high schools. I also take, need to take a moment to thank the co-chairs, Lindsay Wiley and Nick Droon, and our administrative assistant, Kathy Gasky, who were instrumental throughout the process to make the outreach possible. So back in the early fall, when we were all scrambling to get our APLS proposals in, um, uh, Nick and Lindsay, uh, let me include a, question, a couple questions on our submission portal. Uh, after submitting their APLS proposals, people were introduced to the idea of going out to the community and doing some form of outreach. At the time, my task force and I provided four possible options, and by far the most popular option I was delighted to see was one of going into the local high schools and community colleges. Armed with this knowledge, we started reaching out to the schools in Memphis. This process was definitely not without its hiccups. The community college closest to our hotel is on spring break this week. We also had a hard time convincing school administrators we were a legitimate organization <laughs> and that we really did want to come into their school for free. So through a friend of a friend, we finally got a high school administrator who believed us. And once we had that first administrator, she connected, with other, she connected us with other administrators in three different local high schools with several teachers and classes at each school. And even with this being our first time doing such an outreach and learning as we went along, we had more than 20 people scheduled this morning to go out into the high schools to talk about our field uh, and their own research and practice. Some of these volunteers were at these schools at 7.15 this morning. That's impressive. In the process of garnering high schools where we could visit, one of the high school teachers asked if she could bring some of her students to our conference. She teaches U.S. government and practical law students. Um, and once again, Kathy, Nick, and Lindsay uh, helped, uh, stepped up and helped figure out how we could do this. And APLS graduate student members stepped forward to volunteer. So tomorrow, we have more than 20 graduate students who have volunteered to serve as ambassadors for 50 high school students who will be attending our conference tomorrow morning. They will be meeting with them, sitting with them at sessions, taking them to our plenary, and eating lunch with them. Those high school students will be here from 9 until 1.30 tomorrow. They will be attending a few of our 9.15 symposia and our plenary session. And when I reached out to the symposia uh, chairs to make sure they were okay uh, with these students attending their sessions, everyone responded affirmatively welcoming these students. In fact, a few commented that they were thrilled to know that there would actually be people attending their sessions. <laughs> So just like our past leaders in this organization who stood a few moments ago, who have pushed us to where we are, I'd like to recognize those individuals who have volunteered this morning or tomorrow uh, with these outreach efforts these, this year, or back in the 1990s when we were doing this the last time. Uh, so if you have volunteered this morning, you're going to volunteer tomorrow, or you volunteered way back in, not way back, but in the 90s, um, please stand for us so we can uh, um, honor you. I hope the EC can determine if this is something we want to revive or sustain and what such a program will look like in the future. So my family RV trip was exactly 30 years ago this summer. One of those high school students visited this morning who, who will be with us tomorrow could be the APLS president in 2048. And I know, the statistical odds are really not likely, right? But it's kind of fun to imagine. And even if none of those students go on to be a leader in this organization, I have to believe that the actions of those volunteers will leave a positive impact on those students. And just like our past leaders have brought us to where we are today within this organization, we also have much to be proud of in our outward efforts. And what about all those presidential addresses I mentioned? We are probably not as far along as each of those presidents would have liked, uh, for us to be, but I have evidence just from this current conference to show that we have made progress in each one of their goals. For Bill Foote, diversity was a content area added to the conference proposal submission site and used as a way to increase the diversity of our presentations. 
Gen Scheme, uh, for Gen Scheme, the conference reviewers uh, rated novelty of the proposals uh, to increase new areas of research. And for the first time, we had data blitz sessions uh, that allow a variety of unique topics all in one session. Since Patty's app's talk, we have increased our social media platforms. Um, and we're also getting our newsletter out monthly, finally. Um, we just described, uh, uh, and as just described, we're going out into the community to share our science with the young people of Memphis. Jen Woolard, along with Jen Hunt, will be holding a conversation hour tomorrow and in the hospitality suite about social justice issues. And if you didn't notice, many of our invited speakers this year have a bend toward social justice. Continuing Dave's emphasis, uh, last year on legal scholars, the CE committee worked very hard to be able to offer multiple continuing legal education offerings throughout the conference. And additionally, local legal practitioners and scholars received specific invitations to this conference. So that's just our conference. Uh, it's a small slice of who we are, but certainly evidence to see that we have uh, made these priorities and have made progress. I think each of those is a concrete way uh, at this conference that this organization has not just discussed, but is focused on action both internally and externally. And as members of this organization, I hope you can see that we have been given much, much sacrifice of time and talents from our previous leaders, much wealth and security from the careful and smart decision making of those leaders. And we are at a point now, I believe, where much is also due. I have all the confidence that call will be answered. So thank you for letting me be the president of this organization. Thank you to all of you here today, all of you who have been part of my path. I am honored to be part of an organization that does not just disgust, but is filled with individuals willing to suck it up and take some action. Thank you. <laughs>